Well, most of us have experienced it at least once in our lives, one of those God moments. There's different words for this, but what it boils down to is there's, there's a point in your life where you've experienced God has worked something miraculous. He has come into a situation and by his providential hand has delivered you from something, has aligned all of the events to bring about a certain result. And when you look at all the things that happened, you say, well, only God could have made that come about. And we began our story in 2 Kings looking at King Hezekiah last week. And he found himself in the midst of a dire need. He needed a God moment. He was surrounded on all sides. The king of a ferocious army was preparing to lay siege to Jerusalem. They had been taunting the Israelites, calling out their lack of power, calling out their God, calling out their inability to protect themselves, and even trying to persuade them that it was because of their king's turn towards God that had caused this fall, to persuade them that God would not rescue them. And this is where we found Hezekiah last week. But this morning, if we travel back in our minds to Hezekiah waking up, he now faces something very different. Again in his council chambers, King Hezekiah waits for the report from the field. And his men walk in and say, King, Lord, something has happened. Yesterday, the Assyrians were preparing to assault us, but today, as we scouted their camp, we heard no sounds. There was no movement amongst their tents, and it actually appears that they are packing up to escape, to leave. And what's more, King, is it appears that there aren't many of them left to escape in the first place. Something has happened. Overnight, something changed. And as we survey the landscape of the Assyrian army, we see at least 185,000 dead. A God moment. Something only God could deliver them from. And now Hezekiah, getting this news, looks and says, this is what the Lord has promised. So what changed? What happened between this powerful invading force that had destroyed every nation it had come up against, this force that couldn't be slowed down or stopped, this force of at least 185,000 men overnight was no longer a threat, was removed. And Judah, Jerusalem, it appears, was delivered from their enemy. Well, this is the story that we seek to understand this morning as we turn to the, to the Lord's word. And so if you have a copy of God's word with you this morning, I'll invite you to join me in 2 Kings chapter 19. We're going to begin reading this morning at verse 10, and we're going to go through verse 34. In verse 10, it begins with the king of Assyria sending his men to deliver a letter to Hezekiah. And that's where we'll start. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? 
Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Serphavim, the king of Hena, the king of Eva? Clearly, the Assyrian king's letter was meant to provoke fear, is meant to be a, a show of propaganda, a show of power to force Hezekiah's hand, effectively saying, Hezekiah, you should surrender and, and, and save your people by surrendering to us because we have destroyed, we have come up and fought against all of the kings of the lands around you and we have destroyed them and their gods have not done anything to stop us. Hezekiah receives this letter. And we, be, we continue in verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now... O oh Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O oh Lord, are God alone. Then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word that the Lord spoke concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have mocked the Lord, and you have said, with my, with many, with my many chariots I have gone up the heights of the mountains to the far recesses of Lebanon. I felled its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses. I entered its farthest lodging place, its most fruitful forest. I dug wells and drank foreign waters, and I dried up with the sole of all my feet the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from the days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruins." While their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded and have become like plants of the field, like tender grass, like grass on the housetops, blighted before it's grown. But I know you're sitting down and you're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me and your complacency has come into my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will turn you back on the way which you came. And this shall be the sign for you to Judah. This year, what grows of itself, and in the second year, what springs of the same, then in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant. Out of the Mount of Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow here or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we read your word this morning, we trust that you will, by the power of your spirit, let it have an impact on our thoughts, transforming our minds, helping us to be conformed to your will and not the will of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are really two parts of this story, two important parts that we must open up to understand what's happening here. 
Now there's, there's riches beyond riches in God's word. And, and of course, if we had the ability to spread just this story out over the course of many weeks or even months, we might be able to take this even simply line by line, looking at the beauty and the glory of God's word as he has prophesied a victory for Israel and even studying Hezekiah and his prayer to our Lord. But this morning we will separate it simply into two parts. We will look first to Hezekiah's prayer and then we will look to the prophecy and the providence of God. First, we begin with Hezekiah. Now, based on our understanding of his reforms last week, of utmost importance to Hezekiah was getting the people of Judah back to proper worship of the Lord. He reopens the temple. He, he re-cleanses everything. He, he brings the priests in and gets them to do their jobs properly. He gets rid of the false worship and the idols. He gets rid of the, the different statues and, and high places that had been built up for worship to false gods. Hezekiah was concerned with worship. And over the, the course of these three chapters in 2 Kings, you see again and again this repetition of Hezekiah going to the prophet Isaiah to hear what the Lord has to say. Hezekiah is concerned for what God's word is teaching us. But also we see a repetition of Hezekiah going to the Lord in prayer. Hezekiah was a man of prayer, a king of prayer. He wanted the Lord's will and he wanted to go to the Lord with every problem that he faced, and especially a problem against which he had no solution. The solutions had not worked. He attempted to appease the king of Assyria by sending a huge tribute, and yet Assyria still came. He prepared Jerusalem for the battle. He stopped the pools of water. He built up the walls. He, he extended the territory of Judah into the Philistine territory. He prepared for battle for his fortified cities. And yet here he was, and all of the fortified cities had been destroyed. And Hezekiah returns to the Lord. And as this message comes in, as this message comes in from the king of Assyria threatening Judah, Hezekiah goes and does what he knows to do best. He takes the letter from the hands of the messengers, he goes to the temple and he lays it before the Lord and he begins his prayer. Now we should at least take a little bit of an excursus and try to understand exactly what kind of prayer is this. Uh, for those of you who uh, have maybe not been around church life or maybe you didn't grow up going to church, um, there are different kinds of prayers. Not every prayer is the same kind. There's a, there's a bunch of different uh, acrostics that explain different ways to pray in different parts of prayer. I like the Acts acrostic, if you've ever heard of this, and, and it gives us four different kinds of prayer. It gives us prayers of adoration, prayers of confession, prayers of thanksgiving, and, and a prayers of supplication. Now, if we investigate Hezekiah's prayer, we, we can clearly see the adoration that he expresses towards God. It is only one God. He alone is the God of all the earth, the God of all creation. As we read the Lord's Prayer this morning, we see the type of emphasis echoed when Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray. Hallowed be your name, God. Hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. Your name is great. It is your kingdom and your power and your glory. Hezekiah echoes that. But if we had to decide what type of prayer is this in its entirety, if we had to look at this and say, what is Hezekiah's main point of his prayer? I think we could agree that it is one of supplication. In other words, it is Hezekiah going to God and asking for something. He's, he's praying for deliverance. He's praying for God to intervene. He's praying for God to do what only God can possibly do. But there's something important we have to notice. There's something important about the way Hezekiah goes about asking. Notice what he hinges his requests upon. In verse 19, he says, O Lord God, save us please from this hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. At the, center of Hezekiah's, at the center of Hezekiah's concern 
isn't so much that Judah would simply be rescued. He doesn't say, oh Lord, save us please that we may continue to be fruitful and prosperous. He doesn't say, oh Lord, save us please that we might have long life. He doesn't say, save us, O Lord, please, that we might be the most powerful nation or that we might develop a reputation as the kingdom that stopped Assyria. Certainly that could have been on his mind, but that isn't what Hezekiah prays for. No, Hezekiah looks to the Lord and asks and pleads with him on behalf of God's glory. On behalf of God's name and reputation, Hezekiah goes to the Lord and says, don't simply do this, God, for my sake. Don't do this simply, God, for the sake of our reputation in Judah, but Lord, do this for the sake of your name, for the sake of your glory, that all the earth would know you are God. Now, this is a great diagnostic question for our prayers. Get ready for an ouch moment, as I had one multiple times last week as I thought about this question. If God gives you what you're asking for in your prayers, who would be glorified? Now, when I ask myself that, who gets the glory from God giving me what I ask for in this prayer? Whose glory is it? Am I gonna be the one glorified? Is it my plans that I want to see glorified? Is it my name that I want to see be made great? Or would this this answer that God gives, would it glorify him? It's a great way for us to test our pride, our selfish ambition. It's a great way for us to test our prayer life. Am I concerned first and foremost for the glory of the Lord, for his name to be made great, that I could point everything to him. Now, why would that be so important? Because, dear friends, everything in all of creation was created to reflect and to glorify God's nature, his holiness, and his being. Glory is a difficult word to define. John Piper describes defining glory kind of like defining the word beauty. Why is that hard? Because in comparison to defining uh, defining some kind of a simple object like a chair or a basketball, beauty has intrinsic qualities that are hard to describe. If I told you about a chair in our worship center here, I would tell you, well, it's it's a seat, it has four legs, it's cushioned. But if I had to describe what's something that I thought was beautiful, why was it beautiful? Well, that gives me more pause. God's glory could be said to be the manifestation of his holiness in the world and in the universe. This is a central problem for humanity because what do we say? We were created in his image to reflect his glory to spread his glory, to do all things for the glory of God. And yet because we have sinned and because we have fallen, what do we say? We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have fallen short. All things created to reflect God's glory, to point to God's glory, to show us towards his glory. And our prayers our prayers, if we want to be in alignment with God's will, one of the simplest things we can do is ask the diagnostic question, who receives the glory for this prayer? Let us be people who pray for the glory of God, that he would receive all the glory. Now, something very potent, something very interesting happens here. Whereas we often are in our prayer closets seeking the Lord's guidance for problems and we're praying and we're asking for him to solve something or we're to intercede on our behalf. We often have to wait and see how prayers have been answered in hindsight and that's okay. As we go through life, we we can look back at the the path and all the things that God has led us through, the plans that he led us through, and we can say, oh, you can glorify the Lord because he he is the only one that could have led me along this path to where I am today. But we don't have what Hezekiah had. Hezekiah 
had the prophet Isaiah, who had a direct word from the Lord regarding Hezekiah's prayer. In fact, Isaiah tells Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. And then, and then Isaiah delivers us the message from the Lord. And if you're Hezekiah, this is exactly the kind of thing you wanted to hear from Isaiah. Whereas so often in the history of Israel, the message from the prophets was something to the effect of, God is not going to deliver you from this problem because you have continually turned away from him and transgressed his covenant. And so you are being rightfully punished for the way that you have acted. Not in this case. As Isaiah goes to give the, the word of God to Hezekiah, God rebukes the Assyrian leaders. He rebukes them. In fact, God effectively here in these next 10 verses, starting in verse 23, 24 and going on, he's looking at the Assyrian king saying, basically, you're talking a lot of game, but you don't even realize that it was me who caused you to be successful. You think that you conquered all these lands? You think that you defeated all these nations and these other kings and these other gods of your own doing? No, no, no. I determined it long ago, says God. I planned from the days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruins. While their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded and have become like plants of the field, like tender grass. Now, as we consider that, as we reflect upon that, a couple things seem problematic. First of all, what is God saying here? Well, he's saying that this was my plan, that Assyria would rise to power and would invade this land, would destroy kings and nations and cities. In fact, in Hosea 11.5, God says, they, speaking of Israel, should not, shall not return to Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king because they refuse to turn to me. This was given, this prophecy in Hosea was given even before Assyria began its reign and its powerful ascent. It was given at a time when everyone would have looked at Assyria and thought, you think this little kingdom is going to be able to destroy the world? It was given at a time when, when the nations around Assyria were prosperous and were successful. And yet, God looks and gives a word through Hosea and says, no, no, no. Assyria will come and they will destroy cities. And that is exactly what they did. And that's exactly what Hezekiah saw as they came to town, as they destroyed the northern part of the kingdom, beat all the fortified cities, but they did not do it outside of God's control. So now we ask, wait a minute. If this was all part of God's plan, if God is the one in charge here, well then what is the point of praying? If God providentially has sovereign rule and control over the actions, over the events, over the things that are happening around us, God's the one that brought Assyria here, and God never changes his mind. God only does what is good and right and perfect. Why on earth should we pray? Well, first of all, we have to get out of a transactional understanding of prayer. We don't simply pray hoping to receive gifts. We don't simply turn to the Lord and pray hoping that somehow he'll grant my three wishes. God is not a genie. He is a sovereign ruler of the universe. I would even argue to you this. If God's not sovereign, if God doesn't have the providential power to rule the universe as he sees fit, what would be the point in praying there? Why would you ever pray to a God who isn't in absolute control, who can't possibly rule? That would be defeated. That would be pointless. That would be a God who can't keep his promises. That would be a God who's tossed to and fro, but that is not our God. In fact, our God tells us in one of the greatest promises you all have heard in Romans chapter eight, that he works all things for the good of those 
who love him, who are called according to his purpose. God is actively working all things for our good. Even the things that don't seem like they're good in the moment, like Assyria destroying the northern kingdom, like Assyria being used as a vessel of punishment and wrath against the unbelieving people of Israel and destroying the cities and most of the nation of Judah. So how is God working things for good? Well, we get a glimpse of it because God provides a sign to the people of Judah, telling them that in verse 29, this year, eat what grows of itself, and the second year, what springs of the same, and then in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards. In other words, all of the lands that have been destroyed by the Assyrians, that have been taken over, that have been burned to the ground, they will again bear fruit. You will again be able to plant and reap and harvest. And I'm promising this. And, and this is a promise that we see is going to take some time to develop. But he also promises that this enemy that is currently encircling Judah, that is currently encircling Jerusalem, will not be victorious. He says in verse 32, concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city. More than that. And how powerful is our God's sovereign rule and control and providence over top of all events? He says, not only will he not come into this city, he won't even shoot an arrow or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. If you don't know what a siege mound is, basically, is, or Judah is surrounded, uh, Jerusalem is surrounded by a, a huge wall. And in order to lay siege against these walls, they would build huge mounds of dirt that they could walk up and over. They won't even build the mounds of dirt against the walls. He will come, he will go back the way he came. He will return towards his own land. God will deliver the entire city. He will deliver Judah from this enemy. Now let's think for a moment about Hezekiah. We, we understand him to be a man of prayer. We understand him to be a man that is concerned with the Lord. Don't you think that along the line somewhere, Hezekiah prayed for Israel? Don't you think he prayed that Assyria wouldn't destroy the kingdom to the north, even though they had bitter battles between them, north and south? They, were, they knew they were all part of this people of God. I'm sure Hezekiah spent time praying for the fortified cities that were destroyed. What kind of king would he be if he hadn't gone to the temple, gone to Isaiah, asked for words from the Lord, gone to, the, gone to God, interceding on behalf of all of his people, not just the people in Jerusalem, but, but looking out thinking, God, we've got all these people in these fortified cities. We've got all these people in these towns surrounding us, all these innocent people that are going to die at the hands of the Assyrian king. God, please don't let this happen. I'm sure that Hezekiah prayed that when he sent this huge tribute of gold and silver, that he had stripped the temple of all of its treasures and sent to the king of Assyria, I'm sure that as that convoy was going to take this massive loot, that he was praying, God, let the king of Assyria have mercy. Let this tribute satisfy his craving let it be a sign of my, 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 my guilt or my weakness. Let, let, me, let me not be lifted up by pride. God, let this work to save us. And yet, God did not give him any of those requests. God did not stop Assyria from destroying Israel. In fact, it was his plan. God did not stop Assyria from destroying the fortified cities. He didn't stop them when the tribute arrived in fact, the king of Assyria's pride, his arrogance, only grew bigger, more prideful, more arrogant. God did not grant these requests. And we are tempted. This is one of the great temptations of being a human. This is one of the great temptations of being a believer and walking with the Lord is, is we are tempted to say, God, why? Why? I want to know the plan. 
I want to know the plan now before it happens. I want to know when I'm going to walk into a struggle. I want to know when I'm going to walk into a fight. I want to know when I'm walking into something that I am going to lose. God, tell me all the things that I want to know. Now, how arrogant are we that we want to know the mind of God? Need I remind you what Paul says in Romans chapter 11? He says, Oh, the depths and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This must be our position. We must be willing to take God's promises to our hearts. If the Lord says, I will work all things for the good of those who love me, who are called according to my purpose then I must believe with all of my heart that regardless of the circumstances that I face, that God is sovereignly in control. That his ways are above my ways. That though I may not be able to understand or piece together or, or create the plans that he has made in my own mind, he is still ruler. And I would ask again, what kind of God would he be if we could outsmart him? What kind of God would he be if I could figure out all of his plans? I would say that that wouldn't be very godlike. We must be prepared to open our hands to God's will for his glory. And in the Lord's response, just take note of 2 Kings 19, verse 34. As God expresses the purpose and reasoning for his saving Jerusalem, he says, I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. What does it mean for his own sake and for the sake of his servant, David? Well, it's similar to what Hezekiah was praying for in the first place. Lord, that your name would be made great. That, that your name would be made honorable and glorified. That, that anyone who sees this deliverance would know that the only one who could have ever possibly delivered us from this situation was our Lord, our God. And when he says... For the sake of my servant David, let us not forget, this isn't simply because David was a good king. This isn't because David lived a good life. This is because God had made a promise, a covenant with David. And God honors his covenant and promises. In doing so, he glorifies himself because he is the promise-keeping God and he alone can redeem us and deliver us. God does not give us everything we pray for. God does not deliver us from every trouble or every circumstance. However, I do want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you because there, there is a kind of prayer that God will always receive. In fact, there is a kind of prayer that God will always bless and we can read it in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. 
Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being, and you teach me wisdom and the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. This is our prayer to our Lord. Now, when we pray this, we pray this to our divine redeemer, our divine deliverer, our Lord Jesus Christ. As we are caught in transgression and sin, there is only one who could rescue us. This is the most epic God moment that we could ever have in our lives. It's a God moment where everything has led us to a point where we've recognized our fallenness. We have recognized our own brokenness and we realize through the grace of God that there is only one place to turn, that there is only one deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this to our God and God will deliver us. As God delivered Hezekiah, as God delivered Judah from a seemingly insurmountable force. An angel of the Lord went out that night and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. And Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived in Nineveh. God has delivered his people miraculously, powerfully. All the glory to him, for it is a deliverance that only he could do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our divine redeemer, great is your goodness in undertaking our redemption, conquering all our foes. Great is your strength in enduring divine wrath, taking away our iniquities. Great is your love in removing every fear from our hearts. Great is your mercy in ascending to heaven, there to intercede for me, there to receive me to yourself. And great is your grace in commanding me to come hand in hand with you to the Father, to be knit to him eternally, to find in him my peace, to behold his glory, to honor him alone, who is worthy. Grant us by the power of the Spirit to live, repenting of sin and conquering Satan and find victory in life. For yours is the wisdom and the power and the glory forever. And all God's people said, amen.